It's always weird to introduce the interviews that I'm going to do, but I'm very, very excited about this one. When I first met our next guest, I was a little bit flustered. Uh, he's a big deal. And he asked me, what is the greatest question of all? And I kind of sputtered out a few really awkward answers. And he asked me, no, it's are we alone? Uh, Yuri Milner is one of the most successful investors in the world. He's going into space. Well, not himself, but he's exploring with his cash. And uh, we're really excited to have him join us on stage. Please welcome to the stage DST Global's Yuri Milner. Welcome. Thank you. You're worth $3 billion. Is that correct? Possible. Possible. <laughs> no, no comment. Um, I, my first question is like, you invest in these companies that are supposed to reach like huge demographics of people, the everyday man. Do you feel like it's hard to relate to the end users of the services that you invest in? Say it again. Is it hard to relate to the end users of the companies that you invest in? Well, um, it's, um, it's sort of interesting that we have to do it really around the world. About 40% of uh, our capital is invested in the US, 40% in China, 20% in uh, India and Europe. And uh, one would think that things will uh, look very different, just given the diversity of cultures and uh, uh, demographics and so on, but what you see uh, again and again and again is uh, a lot of similarities and a lot of business models that with small variations repeat themselves uh, just um, uh, all the time. So you kind of got that pattern down. Well, that's what we observe. Okay. Uh, that 200 million investment in Facebook really Put you on the map as an investor in a lot of ways. You had a four billion dollar gain, and then you sold the stake in both Facebook and Twitter, right? Well, we uh, 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 we usually don't talk about uh, selling uh, 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 our positions, but uh, we uh, we made big investments in uh, both Facebook and Twitter. We invested uh, eight hundred million dollars total in Facebook and uh, four hundred million in Twitter. And you don't want to tell me whether or not you sold the stock. But who should be the Twitter CEO? Can you weigh in on that? No, the thing is that we, <laughs> uh, um, as a matter of principle, we never join boards of the companies. And uh, this is not for us to make those uh, considerations. So let's talk about that for a little bit, not joining boards. You're kind of um, known for having a very hands-off investment strategy. Uh, what, what's the purpose of that? Why not get involved? Well, we, uh, uh, we do get involved, but uh, on an informal basis. When we invest in companies, they, uh, uh, many of them already have strong boards. And uh, uh, we, uh, we never push ourselves uh, 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 onto those boards. But we, uh, we do keep uh, a very tight dialogue with the founders, and we often um, help them with some insights just from our experience globally. It happens that you would see uh, something interesting in China or India, which can be applied in the uh, in US in a particular situation. And, uh, uh, and that's where we come in and uh, bring the founders' attention to all those uh, amazing phenomena happening around the world. So that's how we see a sort of our value add. In addition, we uh, developed this um, strategy of trusting the founders to the extent that we always give our votes back to the founders so that they can vote our shares. OK, do you think that your money is more attractive to founders because you historically have never taken a board seat? Well, I think initially maybe that was the case uh, when we made our first investment in 2009. But, uh, but more, and more, recent, more and more we see recently that uh, it's our um, sort of uh, global experience and uh, something that we bring to the table which, uh, which really matters when they make a uh, decision to take uh, money from us. You said the other day, how many trips to the moon and back? 
Have you traveled? Well, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the team is really small, but uh, the way we're different from probably most of the other funds is that we have one team, uh, which is global. Uh, one team is covering uh, all the continents. And that really makes our job uh, pretty physical when uh, we have to move around a lot throughout the year. And uh, just before uh, coming on stage, I did a quick math, and uh, turns out that uh, six partners collectively are traveling to the moon and back uh, three times a year, every year. <laughs> OK, that's a lot of travel. Um, speaking of international investments, you invested in Didi and Olacab, transportation startups in India and China. And you said in an interview that Uber was kind of your big flub, that you lose a little sleep over Uber. Given the conversation that's going on right now around 1099 and W2, um, in general, like regulation issues with Uber that they'll face as they continue to expand, are you still losing sleep over that deal? Or is it something that you're kind of okay with? Well, you have to start sleeping again at some point, so you can't just uh, not, not sleep uh, for a long time. But, uh, uh, but I think uh, Uber is really uh, an amazing business. And uh, the reason it is so much more difficult than uh, uh, Facebook and Google uh, is that uh, it is really a very much offline business. It's really this combination of offline and online which really uh, makes it uh, much more challenging to grow as fast as, uh, as they have. And it really calls for a, a special type of person to run these companies because of this um, unique combination of offline and online and the skill set that, which is required for that. OK. Uh, what about like the fact that <clears throat> private valuations have been so ballooned up and then the public market kind of gets their hands on them and takes them down. Do you think that Uber will live up to its 40, 50 billion dollar valuation when it goes public? I think so. I think what uh, many people don't realize is that uh, Uber cannot be valued based on the existing size of the market because Uber itself is growing the market. So when that is taken into account, I think the valuation is absolutely justified. And um, I feel very confident that Uber will do very well uh, from that point onward. So you said earlier that about 40% of your investments are in China, your portfolio. And I think I read on the internet, hopefully it's correct, that about 60% of DST's gains are coming from China. You clearly have kind of a bird's eye view of that space. With what's going on with China's economy, is that part of the same pattern of kind of growth and plateau that we've seen out of China? Or is something larger happening there? Well, it's, uh, it's really hard to say uh, uh, at this point in time. And uh, the next few months, I think, will give us more evidence and clues of what is really going on in China. But I think uh, if uh, US uh, experience is uh, of any guidance, uh, if you go back to 2008, 2009, when uh, really we were making our investments in Facebook, um, it is clear evidence right now that uh, even in a crisis situation when the economy is not doing well, some of the tech companies can actually accelerate. And, and it's easy to understand because many uh, uh, corporations and uh, uh, individuals are um, more thinking about saving. And of course, uh, technology provides uh, those uh, saving opportunities. And, uh, uh, and I think it's very possible that we will see a similar pattern in China. So you have a 7% stake in Xiaomi. Is that one of those tech companies that you see benefiting from this type of situation? Yes, and because uh, they are producing uh, high quality, uh, inexpensive phones, I think there will really be a significant drive uh, uh, inside the China and other developing markets to, uh, to get high quality, paying maybe uh, half the price of uh, some more established brands. You also have investments in JD and Alibaba, uh, e-commerce platforms in China, as well as Wish, another e-commerce platform here in the States. Um, if we could just throw up the slide that I had. Uh, Chinese 
growth in e-commerce has well outpaced that of the U.S., despite the fact that they got a later start than us. Why do you think that that is? Well, it's really uh, an uh, incredible phenomenon. China really started uh, 10 years later, 2005 versus uh, roughly 1995. And the uh, e-commerce market is, uh, is larger, but what's really uh, incredible is that it's growing faster. So U.S. e-commerce market is growing roughly 15% a year, while Chinese uh, market is still uh, being significantly larger, is growing 50% a year. And uh, there are actually uh, a few reasons uh, explaining that. One is that uh, the retail in the U.S. is much more organized. There is about 85% uh, 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 of retail is actually organized in the U.S. versus 20% uh, in China and 10% in India. Um, so from that standpoint, even offline retail in the U.S. is doing pretty well. So there is less of a disruptive potential uh, uh, in e-commerce. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, density of the population in the U.S. is significantly less than in, in China and India. If you take top 10 U.S. cities uh, in all three countries, then uh, you would see uh, the uh, Chinese uh, cities being uh, twice as dense, as densely populated as in the U.S., and in India, actually four times uh, more densely populated. Of course, the density of the population is very uh, conducive to, uh, uh, to efficient shipping, and uh, this is one of, the, one of the drivers. But I think uh, the, uh, uh, the hope for the U.S. market is that uh, the recent data, uh, especially around Generation Y, shows that uh, in the next uh, uh, few years, and maybe this is really the beginning of the big trend, there will be more opportunities for e-commerce even in the U.S. If you look at the data, um, uh, baby boomers had, um, you know, 75% of baby boomers wanted to live in a single family house. Then again, 75% of Generation X and only 50% of Generation Y. So this is, uh, this is really a dramatic shift into uh, uh, moving from single family homes to multifamily homes in the U.S. Another encouraging sign is that uh, Ninety percent of Generation uh, uh, X and baby boomers had the propensity of uh, using cars to travel uh, 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 to, uh, to, their, to their jobs, while only uh, seventy-five percent uh, Generation Y. So, so you see some uh, interesting signs of uh, e-commerce becoming uh, fundamentally more economical, even in the U.S. So, I would say that the possibility for more uh, e-commerce opportunities in the U.S. is really opening up in the next few years. Okay, I want to transition a little bit to the future. Elon Musk had some interesting things to say about artificial intelligence. Essentially, he's not a fan. He thinks it's an existential threat to humanity. What do you think the future of AI is? Well, I, um, I would disagree with uh, Elon Musk on, on, on that one. Um, although I'm a big fan of his uh, space uh, <laughs> exploration and, and, and of course, uh, Tesla. But, uh, but here I, um, I disagree, and the reason is that I do not believe that artificial intelligence is going to develop the way that he believes it will develop, that robots will uh, completely dominate humans and will be chasing them and kind of get rid of them, ultimately. I think that what we see very clearly is that there is a uh, convergence between human brain and, uh, and computers. So Google is a good example of that when you have uh, a million people feeding the machine. You know, all the content on Google is created by human brain. And then there are a bunch of servers that are analyzing this data and feeding it back into the human brain. So there is a very peaceful coexistence uh, between us and Google, and our brains are slowly adjusting to Google being around. The same thing with Facebook. You know, around a billion people are entering information into Facebook, and then servers are analyzing this data and providing value back to us. 
So that's the way I think uh, artificial intelligence will develop. Essentially, is a combination of computers and the human brains. Another interesting example is uh, chess. Uh, it is very obvious that beginning 1990s, computers are better at playing ch chess than humans. But uh, all the tests that have been done so far show that if computer is assisting human to play, then they beat uh, another computer. So human brain plus computer is always better than just computer. Yeah. So if that is of any evidence of how things will play out in the future, that's what I think is going to happen. So rest assured, everyone, we're going to be safe with AI. Um, let's talk about your $100 million investment in breakthrough initiatives. You're going to hunt for intelligent extraterrestrial life. Why go for this very literal moonshot now? Why is the timing right? Well, other than uh, that it was my childhood dream, um, actually many factors uh, have converged to uh, launching this project now. One is that um, we now have a scientific evidence that emerged in the last uh, uh, few years due to NASA uh, telescopes that are, have been launched, especially the Kepler telescope. Uh, so that it became clear now with scientific rigor that there are probably 20 to 40 billion Earth-like planets uh, just in our galaxy. And when I'm saying Earth-like planets, it means pretty much, you know, what you will see when you look outside. There will be liquid water. Uh, there will be uh, um, all the conditions that uh, uh, life can, uh, can use to emerge and pr proliferate. And... Uh, a few years ago, we had no clue. Maybe there would be a few planets like Earth, maybe there will be many. But now we know that just in our galaxy, the number is uh, more than 20 billion. Pretty much every second star, which is uh, the size of the sun, has a planet similar to Earth in a habitable zone. So now we have two options. One is to ignore the scientific data and just say, let's continue business as usual. And the second is, Let's try to do something about it, assuming that given so many possibilities, somewhere life has emerged. There is also additional evidence that life on, life on Earth emerged very early after the Earth cooled down. And uh, we had three and a half billion to, to go between uh, bacteria and us. And other you know, possibilities uh, existing around the world had you know, many more billions of years, because we know the universe is 14 billion years old. So, so this is one. The second is that um, we now have the equipment and uh, we have the software to analyze data at a rate uh, uh, that is much greater than any previous effort. So this effort will be able to analyze the data uh, in a day as much as uh, any previous effort in a year, just because of the software and hardware. And also something which is uh, routinely uh, not appreciated is that to communicate between uh, civilizations is actually, is actually very cheap. So I've, uh, I've just prepared a couple of slides to demonstrate that. So uh, if you just call the first slide. Can we bring up the next slide, por favor? No, no, actually the previous slide. Previous slide. Yeah, so this, uh, this is the largest telescope on Earth, which is called Arecibo. It's uh, in Puerto Rico. It is 1,000 feet wide. And it, you know, we've been using it for, for many years. So the, the next slide, please. So if you imagine that another civilization is no more de developed than us, and they have exactly the same telescope, somewhere in the middle of the Milky Way, then they will be able to communicate with us just using the same equipment. The next slide. So it is extremely cheap to send the signal across 150 million billion miles just using the equipment that we have and uh, the transmitters that uh, are routinely used. The next slide, please. So now this is, a, uh, this is a more challenging task. How do, do you communicate between galaxies? So this is the nearby galaxy, which is called Andromeda. Let's assume that 
the civilization exactly like ours is sitting there. This is much further out. It takes 2.5 million years to send the signal one way. But what would it take to send the signal? The next slide. So this is the, uh, the biggest um, energy generating facility that we have on Earth. It's located in China. And uh, if you go to the next slide, it takes only two of those to connect to the same kind of uh, transmitter to communicate between the galaxies across enormous distances of 15 million trillion miles. So it is an extremely cheap endeavor to communicate between even the galaxies. So we're making the bet that you know, somebody should be sending something out there, and this is our responsibility to keep looking. So part of breakthrough is not just uh, looking, but deciding how we communicate when it's time. I know that you've kind of open sourced that and asked people to submit their own ideas, but I'm curious what you would do if you were in charge what would you say to the intelligent life that we find? It's, uh, it's actually a non-trivial complicated question because not only you need to come up with the content, but also you need to come up with the coding. That's why we think that maybe a few people in this room will even participate. We announced a $1 million prize for the best message that if we hear from them, you know, we would be able to send over. So this uh, competition is ongoing, and we will announce the rules very shortly. But what would you say? I don't know. I didn't think uh, enough about it. OK, fair enough. Last question. What do you want your legacy to be? Well, this is not for me to, uh, to answer that question. And uh, hopefully, I'm not done yet. So we'll see in the next years. I'm sure you're not done. Thank you so much, Yuri. Thank you. Appreciate it.